just second nature. I can't walk down the road without. There's a large, there's a fur. <laughs> you know? A lot of people go, there's a deer, there's an elk. And I go, where? <laughs> I'm seeing the dead fir tree out there by them, <laughs> you know. People think of loggers and tree huggers. Tree huggers are environmentalists. Um, most loggers don't like tree huggers. However, I love being a tree hugger. Um, we are a tree hugger. Um, we love trees. And um, I think logging is just a means that you have to use to manage the garden. So you can call it whatever you want, but it's all environmental. It's all environmentalists. So I consider ourselves 100% environmentalists. Whether we like it or not, human beings are one species on the planet. And we need wood, just like termites need wood, and woodpeckers need wood. So uh, we sometimes cut a tree just because we want some wood, which is okay. But we just don't want to get greedy, and we don't want to cut the wrong tree because some trees are extremely valuable in the woods and others are extremely valuable in our sawmill. And frequently they're not the same tree. Our belief is that everything that was naturally there is important. We don't know all the fancy chemistry and biology and all of that. We just trust that nature knew what it was doing. So we just go by that. Um, we don't have to know all that other stuff. So our goal is to keep every species represented that we can for as long as we can. In one sentence, we're just trying to fit in with nature. That's what observing forestry does. Oh, the top died. It'll grow another one. There, that'll be the new top. The cereal species, cereal species are the ones that like the sun, like pine, uh, larch, and somewhat Douglas fir. Douglas fir is kind of in the middle. These are indicators or maybe representatives of other species. Grand fir is a good indicator of shade tolerant species. Um, we want to basically keep grand fir from taking over and we want to keep larch represented. So it's by far the goal to favor the larch because there's so few of them. And that's why it's such a major accomplishment every time you get a young larch to grow. You keep the smaller competition cut away from the larch because they're dealing with the canopy, which is maximum shade like it is. So um, that's the advantage of coming into a stand like every 20 years or 25 years because by that time this tree will be big and there will be enough competition around that you can open it up and help it out. A forest never all matures at the same time because you have different species of tree that mature at different ages. Plus you have young shade tolerant trees growing in a forest and real old cereal species or real old shade tolerant trees at the same time. So if you cut them all down, you're cutting some young healthy trees and a bunch of old trees and some over mature trees. So uneven age management means that 
We want to grow every tree possible to its maximum potential before harvesting. And sometimes maximum potential isn't very old because they're too thick. But that's the maximum potential for how thick the trees are. So once the tree gets to its maximum age, it starts deteriorating. That doesn't necessarily mean we want to cut them all in an uneven age management process. If we were thinking just timber production, we would. But we're thinking wildlife habitat also. We're looking more at what we're leaving than what we're taking. What we're taking is usually to benefit something that we're leaving. At no time would I ever say we improve nature because nature has existed for thousands of years and that's probably better than anything we can do. Um, we're trying to just keep from destroying the planet in 200 years. So uh, the thing we can do frequently is direct it in a different direction. Like, for example, if there's one little fir tree, dug fir, in a patch of trees, and there's 50 grand fir, the chances of that dug fir getting to be a dominant tree is very small in nature. So this tree is growing good. It's just, if we thin this stuff on the south side of it, and that one there, we could leave this, we'd take one of those, even though they're grand fir, because if you're going to grow grand fir, you might as well help them too. So these two grand fur here are too thick, so one of them should go. What he just did to this tree is similar to one of us winning the lottery. You know, we, we have a shot at life that we never had before. And that's how much, how fast we can make a difference for one little tree. We have to keep in mind that there are species of wildlife that like dense thickets. So you don't necessarily thin everything to what we think looks good. Um, the most important thing is do not use human opinions on what looks good when we're thinning the forest. Humans like things to look really neat and tidy. And frequently, the best neat and tidy for a rabbit is the biggest mess a human being can imagine. So we don't necessarily even thin every little thicket. We leave some of them for all the little critters that don't want the big critters chasing them. So they run into a thicket where they can't go. Clear cutting is an example of, of people using a logging method to control nature, control the forest to get what we want. And it's a way to make it easy because anybody can go cut down all the trees. On a clear cut, when, you, when the trees come up thick, they come up really thick, you have to thin them or they become stunted. And when they become stunted, then they grow really slow. And some of them become defective and certain species like larch will get so tall that the snow will tip them over and wipe out big patches of them instead of thinning them like you do when you're doing it with a chainsaw. It'll thin whole patches of them. That's how nature does it. So most clear cuts, they hire people to go thin them at least once, sometimes twice, before they get a merchantable wood out of them. So that's an expense. 
that we can avoid <clears throat> by working in the uneven man age management method and maintaining an old growth forest. See this, we're looking at how the brush is taken over the clear cut and might win out over the trees. If you look down in this bush, really close down here, you can see a little larch right here. There's actually three of them. This is the biggest one. But this brush is gonna grow three or four or five times faster than that larch. So very likely that larch is gonna get overpowered. This whole area here just seems to be uh, dominated by brush. It would take specific effort to rehabilitate this into a forest rather than a brush patch. Because once this brush gets established, all of these seed trees around won't matter. Um, comparing a clear cut to a forest fire, uh, basically the only, similar, the only similarity is all the trees are gone. All the trees are dead, actually. Because after a forest fire, you have all the snags left. After a clear cut, you don't. So those snags fall over, some of them fall over in 10 years, and some of them last 100 years. So they are falling over all through that time, replenishing the rotting logs on the ground, which serve a huge benefit for uh, moisture retention, for shade for little trees, the snags provide shade even when they're standing. They, they provide wildlife habitat, especially for woodpeckers. And by the time all the snags fall over, you have another forest again because you have a pretty good forest in 100 years. And at no time was there not rotten logs on the ground. And after clear cut, most of the rotten logs are gone in 10 years, even if you leave them. I'm very willing to try to manage the forest so that we don't need that forest fire as often. Sooner or later, it's probably going to happen anyway. But if we do it right, we can maintain the forest and have the same species represented, the same quality of forest as if the fire did burn it up. And so it doesn't have to do it as often. This forest here is about 200 years old. It would take about that long if you started over in a clear cut to get to this caliber of an old growth forest. This is considered old growth, but it's not climax. Um, the shade tolerant trees are here. With the observational forestry technique, we would do minor amounts of work in here but just enough to stimulate a little bit of regeneration and harvest a few trees, but not disrupt the old growth environment for any, any time it would maintain that status. So we don't have to start over. You have to work in here some to thin it out some and get some of those seedlings started or it's going to end up a climax forest where we're going to wait for a clear cut or a fire. That's the choices. So an old growth forest won't stay like this just from now till the last time we were here. These trees were standing right here and now they're down. And that's, that's like three years, which is nothing in the life of a forest. And it's already doing that kind of progression. We can make that old growth forest that is quickly becoming 
one or two species like spruce and grand fir, we can keep that old growth forest having some young larch and dug fir and some pine coming up in it. And we think that's better for everybody. The way we approach logging an old growth forest is, for one thing, you don't want to drive everywhere. Something we haven't talked about is compaction. And when you drive on the forest floor with a machine, it creates compaction. It smashes the life out of that humusy layer of the soil on the forest floor. So that's something we take into big consideration. Most of the time, people say a log left in the woods is wasted. Well, from our term, it is. We're not using it. But from nature's, it's normal. It's like necessary, actually. But that log rots over time and bears dig ants out of it. And who knows? It, it takes several hundred years to develop one snack for a bear. You know, because the ants eventually get in that log and then they come and eat them. And that's it. They rip it apart and it's done. We gotta get another log now and get more ants in it. But if we put that in a brush pile and burn it up, it's gone. And a brush pile burns hot enough that it doesn't even fertilize the soil to make a bunch of really nice trees grow or something. It grows thistles. That's the only thing that'll start growing in a brush pile area is thistles. So you spread all that brush out on the ground and burn it like nature does it, most of the time it just creates a whole bunch of little trees growing. So there's a huge difference. That's why we don't like brush piles because all that nutrients is going up in smoke and nothing's benefiting. That's the definition of waste. So we would rather not make so much brush at once by cutting fewer trees at once, leaving the brush dis distributed out in the woods as nature does it, because nature does that all the time. Trees blow over a few at a time forever. Um, in that way, we're observing how nature works and trying to fit into it. what we're looking at is not doing too much at once because uh, that's the biggest way we can affect things too much. If we don't understand everything that's going on out there and we're trying to fit in, the only logical way to do it is to not do too much at once. We want to try to use the every tree where it's most valuable. And it seems that a lot of them are most valuable left, standing there growing. Because if you don't leave most of them left, then you don't have a forest. That's pretty much the most important part of a forest, is the trees. That's what a lot of people say. How can you expect to have a forest if you cut all the trees down? Well, you can't. So we don't cut them all down. And we try to use the ones we do cut in the highest possible good we can. That's why we have all this stuff in here that we're making um, to try to do that. Even though it looks like an epidemic when the pine beetles or the fir beetles kill mountain sides of trees, nature's not out of control at that point. Um, it looks like it from a human standpoint mm -hmm. that it is, but it's actually probably getting a backing control. Mm -hmm. But now that we're here, we can somewhat do the same thing as the bark beetles by harvesting some of those species logging instead of 
The other way was either a bark beetle killed it or a forest fire killed it, or the wind blew it over, you know. So now there's people. We're in the picture. We're the biggest, nastiest parasite of them all. <laughs> Unless we use our ability to uh, use our discretion, which is what we do. We have that ability and no other animal has it.